Uh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to this session um, on tall buildings versus heritage, I think designed to be as controversial a title as possible, sort of prediction of a kind of headbanger, but I don't think this is uh, uh, really appropriate because I think it's tall buildings in the context of heritage. It's not tall buildings against heritage. And after all, um, in this town, there are tall buildings that have been listed which are already part of our heritage, the Barbican, Millbank Tower, Centre Point, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think what, what, what I hope we'll get in the next uh, 90 minutes, uh, with your input uh, and questions, um, some reflections on um, the appropriateness, the possibilities, the dangers um, of this relationship between what we think of, about as heritage, although what exactly heritage means is, as a word, I think is something that needs some discussion. Um, clearly it's not a synonym for history. Um, but then on the other hand, what exactly is it? And I think that once you start to examine um, the relationship between built form and existing urban environments, one realises that one is in rich and complex territory uh, in which the debate over tall buildings and their contribution um, becomes an additional element. It's not a kind of solo uh, boxing match, if I could put it like that. Um, now, we've got a great panel who I realise that in our own separate ways, we're all professors or <laughs> would be professors. I'm a visiting one, so I never normally use the title, but Simon Thurley, Chief Executive of English Heritage, is a Gresham professor. Uh, Robert Tavener uh, is now an emeritus professor uh, at the uh, LSE, uh, historian, um, theorist and townscape consultant. Uh, and Peter Murray is a visiting professor, Peter. Um, and Peter is um, chairman of New London Architecture. Uh, and I should say, uh, has rather heroically turned up to be with us today because he is in the middle of this extraordinary, <coughs> excuse my cough and cold, in the middle of an extraordinary fundraising uh, event, um, P2P, which is Portland, Oregon, uh, the most advanced sort of cycling city in the US, and an intrepid band of fundraisers are cycling from Oregon via various American cities, looking at how cycling infrastructure is being uh, developed and introduced in those cities. And they're going to end up at the second Portland, which is Portland Place, uh, sometime in early to uh, mid-July. So if you've got a checkbook <laughs> or, or a credit card or indeed any sort of card, Peter, would be very relieved to uh, take some money off you as part of this extraordinary uh, venture. Anyway, he's phoned back for this and also, coincidentally, the London uh, Real Estate Forum, which has been taking place in a tent uh, in Berkeley Square, uh, and he tells me yesterday that the G8 protesters were going round the square with their whistles if they'd only known that the forces of capitalism were inside <coughs> discussing uh, finance and development and no doubt a demolition of much-loved neighbourhoods, they might have invaded the tent. And in the same way, talking to a Turkish contractor at the Serpentine Gallery last night who gave us a graphic account because his children were there and he'd been there of the protests in Taksim Square in Istanbul. What were those protests actually partly about? Partly about the symbolism of demolition and substantial new buildings being put into neighbourhoods, and much loved neighbourhoods uh, of, uh, if you like, <coughs> the older, the more historic parts of that city. So architecture becoming a trope, if you will, for um, or no, maybe architecture as a as a sort of as as a, as a parallel, con concerns about architecture as a parallel for other concerns about what's going on in society and what's going on in politics. And I think, as we've just heard from the um, session uh, before the coffee break, it's quite impossible to divorce architecture and design and height and tall buildings from their political and social context. I think Raphael Vignoli put that uh, very well. You know, architects may think that they're having a crack at doing a bit of social engineering in making their propositions, but actually they are subject to all the forces uh, around them at any given time about which they can do very little other than respond consciously or subconsciously 
with, of course, the aid of clients and investors and planning authorities and the myriad people engaged uh, in the process of creating any building. But in the context of this discussion, uh, these, these kind of local icons, these buildings that are significant, I suppose in the end, because one can see them from all sorts of places, whereas a conventional building can only be seen fairly close to. Um, so let me kick off with my uh, five slides. Um, and firstly, um, I like this because this is a marvellous example of what in its day was quite a tall building, obviously Palace of Westminster and Big Ben, um, suddenly uh, confronted, one might say, with the modernity in the shape uh, of the Millennium Wheel. And there was a great fuss about whether or not this was appropriate. And I remember Lord St. John of Forsley making the classic remark that I love the wheel, but it's in the wrong place. And almost every tall structure in London is described by many people as absolutely perfectly OK, as long as it was somewhere else, uh, preferably not London. So I think this encapsulates part of the sort of argument that goes on about uh, history and modernity. And of course, here in the City of London, uh, we have another contrast because here's uh, the City of London, but then uh, over in the distance, uh, is Canary Wharf, another version of modernity. And in a sense, the development uh, which made tall buildings um, respectable, uh, you may recall that Richard Seifert's NatWest Tower, Tower 42, uh, was for decades the only tall building in the city of London, and then suddenly along came Canary Wharf. And actually the pressure to respond on the part of the city was partly, of course, responsible for the tall buildings that subsequently emerged uh, beginning with the Gherkin and followed by Heron Tower, now all the other ones that we've been describing. I wanted to say something about the nature of, um, of, of function uh, and context. Uh, tall buildings have many purposes and functions, uh, not merely financial. And I show this example of Renzo Piano's tower to show that actually what is going on below ground, I think, in terms of amenity for millions of people is just as important as what's going on above ground because this is the development along with others which will finally resolve the 20th century slum that was London Bridge. Uh, I think it's the fourth busiest station, actually, not the third, as Irvine said or well, the fourth busiest transport interchange uh, in, in, in London and therefore in Europe. Um, it's busier than Heathrow, but the conditions in which people have to engage with the public transport system, of course, are a disgrace. And this, this building is part of the solution uh, to uh, what is going on there. So I think one shouldn't simply think of tall buildings necessarily <coughs> as being about height. They may be about a whole series of other things. Um, and here's, uh, here's the, the uh, cheese grater uh, in section. Now, architect Graham Stirk is in the room here. I think this uh, magnificent building emerging. But again, I think one has to remember this is not uh, merely about height, the amount of public space and the cutout, the ground plane, is of truly heroic proportions. This is the biggest public uh, realm contribution to the City of London since Broadgate, I would suggest. Um, and you will know, of course, that the reason for the deflection uh, of the elevation is to do with views, uh, particularly from the old Cheshire Cheese, the Peter Rees view outside the pub looking at Ludgate Hill, and you wouldn't want a straight line to be in proximity to the Dome of St Paul's. And this um, act of deflection, you might say, of, of deference, of course, has given this building its uh, extraordinary ca character. So, of course, it is about height, but it's about many other things too. And then finally, um, the building that isn't going to happen. So these kind of imaginary, probably a Hayes-Davidson image, I'm not too sure. Um, but uh, this complete, uh, rather picturesque tableau, um, you might say, where somehow the walkie-talkie seems to be merging into the city cluster, whereas in reality, of course, it stands out as, a, as more of a, a standalone, not in the cluster, but uh, uh, displaced from it. And of course, the kind of, um, you know, the, the faux mountain range impression from the Helter Skelter is of course now a fantasy because that building is being redesigned by KPF. So there will be something to come. And I think all I would say about that is that um, the skyline is in a state of constant change. Uh, 
It is not the rational product of the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, it is almost, I think, a kind of um, subconscious emergence of certain building types which are the result of profound uh, forces and pressures, uh, mainly financial, um, partly aesthetic, um, which create the skylines that we see today. And all one can say about this is that the City of London skyline, from being a kind of drab non-entity, a few gaggle teeth in a not very appetising mouth, um, has started to become um, something of extraordinary vigour uh, and interest and uh, geometry and I think that's actually rather a good thing for the city and rather a good thing for London. That's me, Simon. Thank you, Paul, very much. Um, it won't surprise you to know that I want to put a little bit of historical context into this and my approach to all buildings is that really from the very, very earliest point in English history, tall buildings have been a leitmotif of English architecture. And I'm going to show you the earliest tall building in England. This is a Saxon tower. It's a Saxon tower in, in Oxford. And the Saxons from the 7th century, when they started to get the hang of uh, essentially pouring uh, mortar with um, coarsed masonry into shuttered, uh, timber shuttered uh, structures, started to build these um, towers either as gatehouses, as this one here at Oxford was, or in fact as um, residential structures. So from the seventh century, this tower is very nearly a thousand years old and of course absolutely towered over the tiny huts that would have existed in, in, um, in Saxon Oxford. Um, religious architecture, here's Salisbury Cathedral, now, I'm afraid I operate in feet. None of you will, but these buildings were built in feet. That's 404 feet high. Some of you won't have any idea what that means. But it's a very tall building. And um, the cathedrals uh, all deliberately set out to um, belittle the human, uh, the, the human figure, human scale. They set out deliberately to over, overawe um, the, uh, the individual's um, size. And, of course, it wasn't only... Um, religious architecture. It wasn't only religious patrons who wanted to build high. On the left-hand side is Friston Tower, built by a merchant. Um, and if you'd come to medieval London, you would have seen hundreds, probably, well, probably a hundred uh, towers, residential towers, built by merchants um, in which they would have traded, done business, um, had dinner, had drinks on the top. Um, they could be seven, eight, nine storeys um, high. Very slender, like um, Friston Tower there. And I think it was very clear to everybody that these uh, tall buildings were, uh, were civic icons. They were icons of the institutions and they were icons of the engineers and the architects who built them. This is a, a 14th century manuscript showing Old St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, Old St. Paul's, of course, um, was the tallest uh, structure in Europe throughout the entire Middle Ages. It was struck by lightning, unfortunately, in Queen Elizabeth's age. It was 489 feet high. And the way it's depicted on this manuscript just illustrates the, the sense of pride um, and, to use a very modern term, the way that this was regarded um, already as an icon. In the Tudor period, uh, the left-hand side, Leomani Towers, huge, huge um, gatehouse in the middle of Suffolk. On the right-hand side, another merchant's tower, which you'll be pleased to know is open to the public in two weekends' time. It's my house uh, in King's Lynn. Um, there were a number of uh, merchants' houses like this, and um, my tower is the only surviving one. So in case anyone accuses me of having a narrow view towards tall buildings, I have one at home. Um, and then, of course, London burnt down, um, and it was rebuilt. And uh, a really incredibly important point uh, was that right from the beginning, the conception of tall was fundamental to the look of London. And visitors who came to London throughout the 18th century and the 19th century remarked that its most distinctive and beautiful character was this uh, series of towers that um, broke through an otherwise uh, unified um, uh, 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 roof line uh, created by the uh, original London Building Acts. And the Victorians too, of course, um, 
We've already, Paul's already mentioned the Victoria Tower, 316 feet. Uh, Imperial Institute, one tower still survives, Imperial College, 278 feet. And I just put Eton, Eton uh, Tower there in Cheshire, a, a, a domestic one, and the Victorians built very, very tall too. So, uh, rather like Paul, I'm afraid I slightly reject the, the whole notion of the, the, uh, uh, this session being uh, tall buildings versus heritage. Tall buildings are heritage. They are part of our heritage. They have always been part of our heritage, and they will always continue to be part of our heritage. I suppose the issue to debate this morning is uh, whether they raise um, special issues in terms of uh, planning. I don't think, as far as I'm concerned, there is any issue as to whether tall buildings are good or bad things. They are thoroughly good things, and long may they um, continue to adorn our um, cities and towns. Thank you. Thank, Simon, you. thank you. Bob Taverner. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that Simon's presented tall buildings uh, as isolated objects. Uh, what I'd like to do is present them as part of um, a long process um, through time, uh, and a process that involves politics, economics, um, sociology uh, in, in its more modern take, um, and that it's really the process of negotiation that um, allows and encourages tall buildings to happen. Um, and as much as it helps to define cities, Cities um, I'm going to talk about in terms of image um, as well, because uh, I think it's important to get away from the notion that all cities have to be the sort of the ordered layout of a, of a Paris or, or even a Rome to some extent, or the gridded city um, of, of New York. And I, I want to make the distinction uh, by looking at Siena, but it could have been an image of Florence as well, where cities are governed in, a, in particular ways which uh, inform the uh, spaces and structures uh, and their relationship uh, to one another. Siena was um, made up of a number of um, prominent families, Florence uh, the same. They vied with each other as families to create the tallest buildings, um, to create the best spaces uh, for their extended families, and that the city was really a combination, um, a, a societal web, if you like, of, of, of all these things. Um, London, I think, is very similar. It's not like those cities. It's not a city that has been ruled by um, a single monarch uh, determining where buildings and spaces should go. It's come through a process of competition, negotiation. And indeed, this classic image by Canaletto the so-called diptych, which looks downstream to the left to um, the city of London and upstream to Westminster, shows two cities. It shows the commercial city on the left-hand side, uh, dominated by St Paul's, and it shows the political um, city on the right-hand side of Westminster, dominated uh, by a, a Norman structure, of course, uh, Westminster Abbey. And rising up to the right of Westminster Abbey, you can see another tall building uh, from the early 17th century, which was Inigo Jones's banqueting house, which towered over the neighboring Tudor building. So there was always each generation wanting to do something better, stronger, uh, more clearly defined. Um, this image is of London as Venice of the North. That was the image that was being um, conjured up. This process that I'm talking about, of course, extends forward. Um, here, this is uh, an image from the Red Book, uh, a Red Book um, uh, by Humphrey Repton of Wanstead. And um, this uh, Humphrey Repton uh, was a successor of sorts of um, um, Capability Brown, a uh, great landscaper. Uh, but, and he was, had a curious relationship with the picturesque, um, a word that's been mentioned already. But what he did was he used landscape. He, he moved landscape around to create points of focus and to relate the natural world with the man-made physical world very directly. And you can see the top image, which um, shows the view as it, as it was when he was there. And it has this marvelous flap um, of paper, which you then reveal um, the, the new view as intended below. And of course, what he's showing uh, beyond this 
apparently limitless stretch of water is a view of St. Paul's and the City of London beyond. So there's this idea of the natural world and the artificial man-made world coming together in a, in a form of unity and balance. And it's that idea uh, that I'm keen uh, on uh, talking about this morning. We have many rules which define where buildings, tall buildings should go, um, where they're appropriate. Uh, these rules are useful. Um, Raphael Vignoli was talking about that in the session this morning, that the UK has more rules probably than anywhere else, but also what we have is a strong negotiation process which allows many parties to come together to define uh, the future city uh, as well as relating to the historic city. And what's very interesting, I think, about this image of the City of London is the number of over overlaid policies which define where tall buildings can go on the right-hand side in the Eastern Cluster. They can go there purely because there are fewer constraints there at one level in terms of uh, view management, um, in, in terms of St. Paul's Cathedral, which is to the left of centre there, which has a number of viewing corridors protecting it, both its foreground and background. The purple are the conservation areas, where again, tall buildings are thought not to be appropriate. Um, and so the Eastern Cluster becomes a space which is available for tall buildings. There are already tall buildings in the north centre area, uh, which of course are the Barbican with its um, towers listed by English heritage. Um, so it's interesting how uh, spaces are created within a city through this process, through negotiation, to create something very unique. And this is London. This is London as it's emerging. This is an image um, uh, from 2008, uh, before Raphael's uh, building was consented. It shows the pinnacle at the center. Um, it shows um, Graham's uh, building to the right. And it shows the Heron Tower uh, to the left of Tower 42. And there was this idea that I, I remember Peter Rees talking about, the idea of a topographical form, um, a hill-like form, in a sense a, a reference to natural forms, uh, which would draw the eye, which would reduce the impact of the individual tower um, and create an entity separate from St. Paul's Cathedral so that the two could be enjoyed, enjoyed separately and together and that relationship changes as you move through the city. So it's really what I'm interested in is the process that leads to these things um, rather than, again, um, um, an either-or. Thank you. Robert, thank you. Peter. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I also want to talk about re relationships, and uh, we've uh, all three of us have selected views of uh, London uh, in its historical context and uh, chosen for slightly different reasons. I chose this one because it shows uh, the massive and quite inappropriate scale of uh, St Paul's when it was built at the time, um, specifically uh, put on the top of a hill to make it seem even bigger and more out of scale with all the stuff and the trading that went on down below. Um, and I think uh, this raises a couple of interesting issues about the way that London works and the way that things have changed. First of all, you know, this was uh, 80 years after the Great Fire, and uh, so it shows a relatively low city. Um, uh, you, you go on 100 years and uh, the city has got higher and uh, another 100 years and it's got even higher. So uh, St Paul starts to become more submerged, as you saw in that last image, which Robert showed, uh, within the overall context. You can still see it, but it is less exposed than it is in, in this uh, uh, sort of image. And that's been uh, continuing on it, uh, through other cities as well, but certainly in London it's happened. And I find it very bizarre that uh, Simon Jenkins, uh, uh, a right-wing journalist, um, uh, a conservationist uh, was uh, bemoaning the other day that the view from the monument, which was built after the Great Fire uh, to, to, to mark uh, the start of the fire, uh, that he, he could see modern buildings uh, from the top of the monument, which is itself a, a relatively low building within the city, but he didn't like the idea that anything had actually even come close to uh, heights of buildings that were perfectly normal within the time of rent. So uh, uh, I think uh, we have to accept that there is a changing height of, of the city, both within the city itself, but also London as a whole 
particularly within the current context of uh, densification and compact cities. Um, the other thing is, I think, that the image showed is the, I might say, the, the, the pragmatic nature of uh, planning in London that, uh, of course, uh, Wren's uh, grand uh, Renaissance scheme for the city of London uh, never happened because the uh, traders and businessmen in the city of London merchants wanted to get back to business without hanging around for uh, 10, 20 years for a grand master plan who built. They wanted to start, get back to business straight away. The, so the, it was a, a system then that was responsive to the commercial needs, pragmatic commercial needs uh, of the area. And it reflects the fact that, to a certain extent, the planning system uh, in uh, London is about, it's about arguments between neighbours uh, uh, rather than about uh, grand visions. And, of course, uh, as uh, Robert mentioned, a lot of the uh, way we uh, restrict the scale and uh, location of tall buildings is to do with uh, St Paul's uh, Cathedral, which, of course, burnt into the uh, national psyche after the uh, Blitz. And uh, in the way, when I see the black clouds uh, around uh, St Paul's, it reminds me of uh, 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 Prince Charles's comment that developers cause more damage uh, to the uh, city of London than the Luftwaffe. And to a certain extent, those black clouds may be seen as uh, emerging tall buildings ar around St Paul's, but we keep that view. And I always think it's rather ironic when we talk about East and Cluster that that actually obscures the views of St Paul's from the East, where, all the, where the poor people live, and they're the people who suffered most during the Blitz. They don't get a view of St Paul's. Um, I'm never quite sure why. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, from Leafy, Hampstead and uh, uh, Richmond, uh, you still can get nice views of St Paul's. But I have to say, and I cycle around Richmond Park every weekend, I uh, find the view of the Shard now much more inspiring, actually, than the rather small uh, 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 and now half-submerged uh, uh, dome, which uh, gives a very exciting... The Shard has added enormously, I think, to the profile and delight of that view of London. And I think it is this relationship of uh, the, uh, how uh, buildings do relate across a skyline, because this I took uh, only last week in Madison in Wisconsin. And uh, as a part of the ride you heard about earlier, we were being taken around by the local bicycle coordinator, and he said, you've got to come and see our skyline of the city. So we went across the other side of the lake, uh, and he showed off the Madison skyline, where all buildings are controlled, they, like in Washington, uh, none can be higher than the lower edge of the Capitol's dome. And his comment, uh, uh, not, not, not a politician, but uh, just the local bicycle coordinator, was, isn't it a boring skyline we've got? And it really is a, a detriment to the economy and economic vitality of the city, that uh, there are, are these restrictions in place. So I thought that was very relevant to uh, 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 what we're discussing today because I hate to think uh, what the British economy would like if we hadn't been able to build any tall buildings in London uh, over the last 20 years because I'm sure that uh, uh, the uh, occupiers that are currently in the city and the uh, city in its more general, uh, including Canary Wharf, would have gone elsewhere by now. But uh, I think the relationship between the old and the new is just one of the key elements which makes London such an exciting place to be. And you see it in every street you uh, uh, walk through, whether it, they're high buildings or they're consistent height. This relationship between old and new is something that I think uh, means that you know, ev 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 every street tells a story. And I use this image uh, from the Olympics, the view from uh, Greenwich during the equestrian events looking over towards Canary Wharf, because I think in terms of understanding what, uh, uh, might say, popular interest is about whether it's scale, tall buildings and the uh, relationship to heritage, I think probably uh, the, the, the sort of television uh, people have selected their views very carefully indeed in terms of what are the things that... Uh, will uh, appeal to billions of people around the world about uh, how uh, they envisage a city. And I think that uh, this uh, relationship of the uh, uh, Greenwich uh, with Canary Wharf in the background uh, 
uh, says uh, a lot about uh, uh, London, uh, contemporary London, and I think adds to the excitement of London as a place. Uh, as I say, it's a place which is generated through uh, pragmatism and argument rather than the grand visions of a lot of continental cities, uh, but that's what makes it much more exciting than all of them. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for that. <coughs> well, I think there are a whole series of uh, issues raised uh, by these presentations, but I want to kick off with a general one, which I'd like you to pick up first, Simon, which is actually what, what, what is it that we mean by heritage? I mean, we talk about skyline, um, but of course um, heritage is always with us in the sense that every, every day is different and uh, every year produces new buildings. Um, is everything heritage or do we have to really think about that in a more precise way? How is that dealt with in terms of the legislation that governs things like the relationship of tall buildings or large buildings uh, <coughs> to existing um, historic areas? Would you like to make some comments on this? Because I, think, I just think the word heritage is banded throughout the whole time. You know, you don't get heritage tomatoes. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a sort of, you know, the heritage room. It's a sort of badge of honour. Um, in British culture, but it's not much discussed as to actually what it is. The heritage is a, is a, is a difficult word. Um, when a friend of mine became the director of the Imperial War Museum, he said, you know, there are only three problems I've got to confront, and that's Imperial War and Museum. <laughs> and I kind of felt like that when I came to English heritage. I mean, English is not an easy word to deal with these days either, and heritage certainly, as you say, um, Paul, isn't. And I think you're quite right. There's a, a, a rapidly changing view of what heritage is, and I think... Um, Robert's presentation was, was very useful in drawing out the focus from individual buildings to places. Because I think increasingly um, we regard uh, uh, buildings as part of places and we assess them as part of places and we want to see how well they work as part of places rather than as isolated masterpieces um, in themselves. And so I think part of the um, changing view of, of, of what heritage is is uh, moving out from the consideration of a relatively narrow set of issues about who built this building, how, how uh, does it perform aesthetically, um, what is its historical significance, to what is, it what is the contribution it makes to the place in which it sits, and how does it interrelate with, with other um, issues. And of course, what that does is it opens up um, many more difficulties in terms of, of planning. Because if you're simply focusing on an individual structure, as you do, for instance, in the Portuguese system, when there's a 30-metre sort of ring around the outside of it, and that is the bit that's protected, you haven't really got very much of a problem. But if you are looking at Westminster, and you're looking around the area uh, around uh, um, the Palace of Westminster and uh, Westminster Abbey, and you're looking at a building that can impinge on that place in a wider sense, you are considering something that is infinitely more complicated. So I think, uh, in answer to your question, the sort of expanding appreciation of what heritage might be in terms of it being the, char the historic character of places rather than the historic character of individual structures makes it a much more difficult issue to deal with in terms of planning. It does, because it means that the line is less precise. Mm. It's Absolutely. eliding. Mm. Robert, and this is... Um, the difference between conservation areas in Westminster, I think 80% of the borough is now a conservation area. But there's now uh, a thing called, I think, uh, the character areas, which are not conservation as such. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they have certain characteristics. People kind of like them. They may be associated with certain things. And actually, that may be considered as having a value all of itself. Allying that to conservation areas, and we get we could get close to saying, well, in, in fact, I mean, in Westminster, I think it's almost there. I don't know why they don't just say the whole borough's a <laughs> conservation area and use the same policies towards it. But do you see this as, as a kind of creeping condition or a useful one or I, both? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for both. Um, I think as, a, as an architect and having taught architecture students as well, where you always start is to understand the place. Um, what is it about that place physically, spatially, that makes it work? What, what shaped it um, over time? So uh, memories are important as, as part of that as well. 
so I think it's always important to have that as a datum which you can start conversations with other people around. And now there are always going to be difference about the, the weight and value of aspects of what one is looking at. Um, but I do think it has, to, in the planning sense, has to be made much more tangible um, than um, just uh, to do with memories and so on. I mean, recently, um, I won't say where, but I got involved uh, with an English heritage dispute uh, because um, a particular building was listed because it had once been an eel and pie shop. Now, that eel and pie shop was now a Chinese takeaway, and the building itself of no particular interest. And the building that I was working on, uh, I am working on, which has a tall component, was several doors away. Now, how does the impact of a tall building on an eel and pie shop, which is no longer an eel and pie shop, really, really, why is that a major issue? But that did lead to a, a letter which uh, uh, was, was problematic at the time and was used then by councillors to... Uh, to refuse the application, so as part of, of, of a web of um, other issues. So I think we do have to be clear about what is of value in terms of pla a planning sense, uh, rather than just being generally interested in heritage as a, as a, as a long-term um, historical um, um, ev series of events. But Peter, this raises the question of um, whether whether localism, um, the idea that neighbourhoods, very popular at the moment um, as part of the planning system, in some sense um, own the heritage of their own territory and their own place. I was thinking of the example of, uh, of the David Chipperfield Jeffrey Museum proposal where, although it's not a tall building, it's exactly the same issue in certain respects, which will come back to the, the thing about Parliament, uh, Parliament Square and, and views of and from, but where it became uh, impossible, as far as the locals were concerned, <coughs> to do a development because it involved knocking down a pub which hadn't been a pub for 30 years and never, yeah. never will be again. But one can, one can see there's some, some sympathy um, for a view that the people on the ground it may not be our heritage, but it's kind of their heritage. Yes, yeah, but, <coughs> but of course, tall buildings... Uh, uh, Im Im impact on it in a different way, don't they? Because we're talking about skyline in the main, and so you can have a perfectly nice place, and then suddenly up behind uh, a building uh, pops up a, a, a skyscraper of some kind, which of course has upset people in Ealing, something rotten, and they've uh, uh, stopped various things ha happening there just because of that. And of course that whole debate about uh, how you deal with... Uh, that uh, relationship of, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking about uh, uh, Westminster and Chipperfield in a minute, but uh, um, who uh, decides um, uh, what goes on, this sort of uh, uh, the uh, fight between the North Bank and the South Bank about who should have development, I think is, is, is a key part of um, how areas like that defend their patch or what they accept. And I, I thought it was very interesting reading Simon's comment in um, Building Design last week, where um, you used words like ruin and spoil and uh, about uh, the relationship of newer buildings to older context. And, and I think that uh, it, where buildings... I mean, I can see lots of places where tall buildings enhance and I can enjoy them as well. And it's, uh, we're looking very much at... Uh, uh, I mean, maybe it's localism, maybe it's uh, uh, popular ideas, but uh, do we like a building itself or do we just not want it in my backyard? Well, it, that raises a question about whether the skyline is itself a place, because yeah. the way people talk about skylines, you think it was a kind of little English village um, which was going to be despoiled by, by an evil uh, developer. <coughs> and we might get Ian Davidson to say something about that later since he's thought a lot more about um, skylines than, than most in his visualisation work. I mean, is the skyline, in a sense, a place? Is it something that I, we, I think we I, can I, admire? It, it is an open space, I think. I, I can remember the debates where we had, had an exhibition, organised an exhibition at the Royal Academy about uh, called Living Bridges, where we had a competition yeah. for building a uh, livable bridge across the Thames. One of the interesting debates about that and the public response was that uh, if you put, built a bridge which was 
usable by the public, it was fine. There were a couple of the schemes which proposed a park even hotels on the river, and people didn't like it. But the fact that if it was public, it was felt to be acceptable because the space above the river was seen as open space. If it was public, it was fine. For private use, uh, people didn't like it. And I think that, uh, that uh, you know, the skyline is really an uh, important part of open space in London, and, which is why I like the Leadenhall building so much. I think it's, it's polite. It sort of doffs, it, it literally doffs its cap to St Paul's, and I think it's, it, it's, it deals uh, properly with that open space. Robert? But, but another aspect to that, which, which none of us have really talked about, is what Skyline symbolises. And I think this came up at the Heron Inquiry, which was my sort of baptism of fire with this world. Um, because I remember uh, someone objecting because uh, it threatened the, um, the, the character, the quality, the memory, but also the, the religious aspect it was felt of St Paul's Cathedral, that, that St Paul's should be seen as rising above the city because that was where spirituality resided within that part of London. And that what the tall building represents in the city of London, which is what we were talking about there, was mammon, was greed, was bankers, and all those, those dirty words which have been banded around uh, not only yesterday, but over the last few months and years. And, and it was really that opposition. It was really what one represented as much as its visual impact. Um, but I mean, again, that is why it's important to understand what the city of London is about, what are the type of buildings it needs, and people are going to react uh, inevitably to that. So it's, it, again, it's, it's, skyline is emotive, not only because of it's visi visibly changing over time, and the St Paul's Heights was obviously a response um, with, to taller buildings, um, Unilever House, Faraday House, appearing in relation to St Paul's from, from river views. But it wasn't the symbolism, I think, so much then that was the issue, um, as it's become in the late 20, early 20, 21st yeah, century. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> for me, the skyline is a, is a shared space, uh, whereas a street is, is, is not necessarily like that. It's everybody's space, the skyline, which is why it arises such um, <coughs> passions. Um, and we've seen some extraordinary juxtapositions with, with the Shard, a, a building that you keep on thinking you know, and then suddenly you realise that you fundamentally don't know. I was in a part of London yesterday, and I sort of caught, caught a glimpse of it, and it completely changed my whole perception of that bit of London. And that is why, um, uh, you know, this is an issue, is why we're even talking about it, is because the skyline is a shared space that belongs to everyone, and therefore everyone has a view about it. Well, of course, the funny thing is that the, the Shard is a standalone. I mean, I remember when uh, Renzo got very, very cross when uh, that crank plan Seafoot Tower mm. at the front of London Bridge Station was owned by somebody other than Irvine Seller at the time. <coughs> they produced a tower design um, by KPF, quite tall. Mm. Renzo was most disapproving. He said they shouldn't be building a tall tower next to my tall tower. Yes. Um, and you could see why he would say that, because this thing had been designed as a sole piece. Now, when I've, Irvine Seller bought that old Seafoot Tower, he got Renzo back in to do <coughs> whatever it's called now, I can't remember the name of it. The place. Uh, the place, the lower rise uh, <laughs> building. And of course, <coughs> being the same architect, he's responded to himself um, in a very, very impressive way. On the other hand, if it's London and it's commercial, mm. it's difficult to see that that other tower design wouldn't have got approval, mm. whatever impact it might have had on Renzo. And it was difficult, really, when to, I think he was on dangerous ground because if you took that argument, you might just as well say, well, in that case, what you're saying is um, that there is no argument for making Skyline as a place or ideas of a cluster, and it can only be the one single object. Now, if that's right, then why shouldn't we give total protection to the Dome of St Paul's and say nothing could ever be allowed to interfere with it. I think it was, a, it, it was a moment which Irvine resolved by buying the building or it was offered to him and he bought it and uh, it's happy ever after. Peter? Yeah, I can remember Dennis Lasden leading a campaign to try and stop the 
tower in Waterloo, which I think now has his three eye or something like that, just behind the National Theatre, because he felt it really offended the profile of the National Theatre uh, to have a taller building behind it, which I, I, I thought was a bit rum coming from somebody who had also designed towers himself. Well, there, it does raise this question of background and vista, um, because, of course, the truth is that you can see anything from anywhere once, once it's tall. Everything has a relationship. Um, you just have to find the right spot. I remember being shocked <coughs> suddenly in Plantation Place, getting a view of um, the Dome of St Paul's, apparently with the post office tower rising from it, because mm -hmm. I just hadn't thought about it in that sort of, if you get the protractor out and a bit of string, yes indeed, you just keep running round and you will find the relationship. Mm. But as you say, it does change your mental map. But people get very cross about vistas, don't they? Well, I think that the, the, the big issue is what is it that people value? Mm. Um, what is significant and, and, and you know, how then do you protect that? Now, uh, somebody, I think it was you, made the point that um, the Dome of St Paul's is generally thought by most people to be significant mm. and to have value yes. and planning policy uh, essentially reflects that mm. um, and there are a number of other places in London that have been uh, accorded that sort of status um, but of course people's values change mm. what people value and what people think is significant changes by generation mm. uh, um, you know, people who are in their um, teens now um, are much more likely to uh, admire buildings built in the 70s than politicians in particular um, who are in their 60s. And th that changing value um, will need to be reflected and, uh, and has to be reflected gradually in the, the changing nature of the planning system. And that is, that is really where the difficulty comes because there are some things like the Dome of St Paul's, like Durham Cathedral, all sorts of things you could name, which no one is seriously suggesting that you are going to compromise the, um, the setting of. Um, and then there are other things that people think, well, clearly we must change the setting of this because it's a, a disgrace. There's a big grey penumbra in the middle, which is where the controversy lies. And the question is, is how do you make that, that grey area as small as possible by identifying the things that people really value and protecting them and saying that the other things, you know, these are things that we should change and we can enhance and we can make better. Now, we should, if we were getting specific about this, um, English Heritage supported the Gherkin, quite controversial at the time because there were people who thought that the existing building on the site had merits and, and, and should have been kept and there should have been more of a kind of hybrid building. <coughs> quite brave, quite bold. That set a precedent, really, for all the tall buildings that have subsequently followed in the city. And I wonder, Simon, whether um, you think actually that in opposing the Heron Tower, um, and then not in the city, but the Shard um, on, the other, on the other side, and, and slightly reluctantly going to inquiry on the walkie-talkie, is that because um, you think you're right on the button as to where um, our values lie? Or in <coughs> retrospect, do you think actually you, you were behind the game, certainly on the Heron Tower, because um, it, it got a fair run from most other people? Um, or do you think you might be ahead of the game? I mean, I ask this because um, my experience of English heritage is that I've agreed with about, I should think, 95% of everything it's ever done. But when there's been a disagreement, it's always been a big one, and it seems to have absolutely focused on tall buildings and on views. And I, I, I wonder whether, in retrospect, you think, well, actually, <coughs> we might have been more generous about the Heron Tower, uh, or indeed the Shard, or do you still think that they had to be, as it were, fought out in blood at inquiry just to determine what was what? Well, obviously, first of all, there are a lot of other controversial cases that aren't tall buildings. Um, yeah. They might not be happening in London, but I can tell you um, in Birmingham and in Manchester and other places, there are all sorts of controversies. So, um, but, but tall buildings in London do grab the headlines. There are, there are colourful um, people involved. There are lots of money involved. Uh, it's in London where the seat of the media is. So they do get a lot of attention. 
Um, both the Shard and Heron were actually uh, um, just before my time, yeah. um, but I do agree with you that um, I think, in retrospect, it was probably uh, not advisable to have fought the Heron Tower so hard, because you look at it and it's ab absolutely, you know, it's not a, it isn't a problem. I think, as far as the Shard was concerned, there was a, there was a question to be answered, <coughs> And I think there was a debate to be had, and it was right that that debate should have been had in public. Um, and I think that the, the, the function that the public inquiry had was to legitimise the building, um, because all the issues were, were laid out. And even um, Irvin Seller um, a, a agrees that actually it was a beneficial process to have that public debate, because as I say, it, it did create a legitimisation. So in terms of those two, um, and that's, that's what I feel. Of course... Um, the walkie-talkie we all got dragged into, didn't we? Because... Well, we didn't have a lot of us, really, <coughs> the, 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 the walkie-talkie. I mean, my view is the walkie-talkie is a catastrophic mistake for London and is a, um, you know, something we will regret for many years to come. But um, you know, we didn't, as you say, we didn't ask for call-in. We didn't have a yeah. locus. I mean, we, as you say, were sucked into an issue. Yeah. Bob? Well, I think, yes, I, I mean... Again, I think uh, I'm very supportive of what English heritage does and, and, and its role in, in the whole process. But I, I think it's um, slightly disingenuous to sort of say, well, it, it was a sort of a positive outcome. I mean, the, the problem with the public inquiry is the cost involved. Um, I mean, okay, okay, you can have a debate, but it delays the whole process considerably. Um, yes, a, a key important building should be um, debated, but there is a process for that debate that doesn't need to go to public inquiry. And back in 2001, English Heritage and CABE um, got together to write the first draft of um, the Guidance on Tall Buildings, which is a very valuable document, which brings together a set of principles about what makes um, a tall building appropriate and suitable uh, in certain locations, and it helps designers and clients <coughs> understand what they will have to achieve if they're going to get their building, their tall building built in a, in a particular location. And I think, I, I think it's the um, division that is created through the public inquiry that is a problem. I mean, I, I've been fortunate, I've worked with, with very good English heritage officers who have been very helpful to the process, people like Paddy Pugh and so on, 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 on major projects. And um, ideally, you want those conversations during the process, some clarity about what is acceptable and, and, and what isn't, uh, um, but not in a too much of a black and white situation. It's a matter of, in a sense, joining the negotiating, nego negotiating team and really perhaps being clear about what English heritage is good at, which is acting as guardians for um, English, England's heritage, whereas Cabe's role or was, although it's obviously much diminished, was in terms of understanding design quality and enforcing design quality. And I think that's the real problem, is when English heritage have stepped into the more subjective design opinion role rather than in a sense leaving that to we're well, not leaving it to but actually allowing the emphasis in terms of decisions to come from design experts if but you if, like. if if skyline is if skyline is place um it, that suggests that vista of course that you know there is a public interest in that um and whether one likes it or not um it's a matter for debate peter you obviously admire the Shard, did you admire it at the time when it was being designed? Did you think that it would be great? Did you have reservations? And did you think it was appropriate to have a public inquiry, actually? Well, I think I was very surprised that uh, anyone should uh, try to build something quite so big. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was surprised that it actually did, in the end, get permission, uh, just because of its scale. And I think that that's, it's, uh, it reflected to me um, uh, one of the <coughs> failings, I think, of, of, of our process at, at the moment, of the sort of uh, whim, uh, whimsy that comes out of uh, the, or things being decided by whim, almost, in terms of scale and where things happen. And we've just seen it at Vauxhall, that suddenly an application comes in for a 54-storey 50 building, which was 
in a cluster of much lower buildings, but suddenly we find uh, there is a whole shift in uh, how that is going to be impact on the city without any very much public argument at all. And then, of course, we had Prescott and Vauxhall Tower suddenly popping up just because he thought it had a wow factor. You know. And it seems to me that uh, although in the London plan, uh, all boroughs uh, you know, are uh, expected to have areas where tall buildings are and have some sort of framework, of height, um, uh, not all of them have, and uh, even when there are, uh, these are, uh, you know, a, a developer can feel quite uh, f free and may succeed to say, oh, I might try something a bit bigger here, let's have a go. And, uh, and I, I, my feeling is that actually what we need to do is to uh, make sure that uh, uh, there is a much more serious look at public debate about the frameworks of, of height and location, as Southwark are doing at the moment. Southwark are really tall building oriented borough at the moment, but they are actually looking at the, uh, you know, where um, taller buildings should be and where lower buildings should be, and gives more certainty to developers. Also, would allow for a much clearer idea, both in the public's mind and in the developers' minds, about where and how high things could be. Of course, the old Southwark plan said that London Bridge Station was not an appropriate place for tall buildings. I mean, it's a kind of... I love the sort of... It's almost the planning archaeology of all these things, isn't it? Now, before yeah, I... You can, you can it, review these things. You can yeah. review these things as attitudes as they change. Did. Yeah. As they did. Before I throw this open, I just want to deal with the other matter of the moment, which is... Or still the matter of the moment, which is, to me, an absolutely intriguing question, which is the David Chipperfield Elizabeth Tower proposal. Now, for those of you who don't know about this story, imagine you're standing in <laughs> Parliament Square looking directly across towards Big Ben and to the left of Big Ben, there's Westminster, there's Bridge Street and that leads to well, Westminster Bridge Street, which leads to Westminster Bridge to go to the other side of the river. So you've got, if I'm standing here, there's Big Ben, there's the gap, there's the Michael Hopkins Portcullis House building. And from certain views in Parliament Square, you will be able to see a proposed quite large building by David Chipperfield, not super tall, certainly by American standards, but tall, at Waterloo. And the fact is that this is a protected view. It's been adopted by the mayor and his London views Management framework. management framework, the L dreaded LVMF. So when this development came in, hey presto, it's in this view which the mayor has adopted as a protective view, but the mayor likes the scheme. Lambeth Council, the local planning authority, they like it. Everybody likes it. It resolves an attempt to redevelop this part of Waterloo that's been going on for 30 years without any success. And English Heritage says, that's a protective view. Westminster Council says, that's impacting not just on Parliament Square as an address, but on what is the UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Palace of Westminster. <coughs> it should be opposed. This gets a local planning approval. It goes to the government. The government says, we think this is a matter for local approvals, so you guys get on with it. The Mayor of London has approved it. But Westminster and English Heritage are opposed to it. And actually, of course, I can see why they're opposed to it. There's a protective view. The building's in the view. Um, why, why is this going ahead? Now, I've tried to sum this up as fairly as I can. Simon, is that a reasonable uh, summary? And, and what can you tell us about Westminster's threat to go to court to get this planning decision overturned? Have they finally come to a conclusion about whether they're going to do the almost unthinkable, a conservative municipal authority taking a conservative Secretary of State into the courts over a planning permission? Is it going to happen? Well, I can't, I can't answer for Westminster, but I have seen the, um, the advice that the Minister received, which uh, Westminster received through a, a Freedom of Information request, which is essentially three pages of completely blacked out text. Um, it's been totally redacted, the whole thing. And there is no way that Westminster, or for that matter English Heritage, can feel remotely uh, uh, convinced that the planning minister did indeed take into account 
as he is obliged to by his own rules, the fact that it's a protected view and that it is a World Heritage Site. There is no evidence that we can see that he's done that. So it may well be that um, Westminster decide to take the matter further. Um, but as I say, I can't comment for it. But it does, you know, we, you showed the, the, that map which had the various viewing cones and things mm -hmm. on it. And we have a system. I mean, if we have a system, surely the system is intended to protect things that people have, through the democratic system, identified as being uh, important um, and treasured by, by you know, the yeah. public. And I think views in and out of Westminster Square, uh, uh, Parliament Square, just must be amongst those. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is astonishing, I think, that um, everybody has just tossed to one side their own regulations and um, said that the thing should go ahead. I've it's not a tall building, as you say. It's a big building. It's big and, and one other yeah. thing I just should say, because people are scrib <coughs> scribbling down in this room, I should say that um, the developer, Stuart Lipton, has tried very hard and worked very, very hard to try and minimise the impact of that building. But the difficulty is, if you try to put Europe's largest office block in terms of square footage in that spot, it is very difficult to make it go away. I mean, I should say I've been scrupulously fair because I don't think that view should have been in the framework to start with. <coughs> and I, th I think, anyway, let's get a view That's from a Robert. Issue. That's it a is. Issue. Robert and then Peter. Yeah, well, I, I obviously agree with you. I mean, I think there are very important views which need protecting. Um, and uh, they do shape London and the way it's evolving, as we've, we've referred to already. I don't think that the view out of Parliament Square, and particularly that view, is a particularly powerful one. Um, as you say, it goes, part Port Collis, uh, Port, goes past Portcullis House, which is a modern building. <coughs> there are trees in the middle ground of that view. The um, LCC building, um, the old former LCC building across the river, is a listed building, but it's already got things emerging above its skyline, its, its roof line sure. and so on, including the shard. Um, and indeed, really, the real pleasure is moving out onto Westminster Bridge and enjoying the whole expanse of the river uh, and so on. So, so to have, I, I think the issue um, is, in a way, again, less about the, the design quality of the building. It's by, obviously, one of our leading architects, uh, by a leading developer, and they've, 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 they've done what they can to make all that work. I think it's, it's really the question is, is it such an important view? when the site is actually a considerable distance from that viewing position and actually any, a par, has a partial impact on the experience of Parliament Square. Peter? Yeah, my view is that if I was mayor, I wouldn't have protected that view, but uh, having protected it, I think it, it, it is unfortunate that uh, ministers then drive a coach and horses through something which is a perfectly uh, agreed... Well, the, mayor, the mayor's driven the coach and horses through, yeah. to, be, to be clear yeah, about it. Well, I'm the planning, planning minister. I, mean, I, I think you're all right. And the point, the point is, is we either have a planning system and everybody plays by the rules, or we don't. Now, you two both question whether that view should have been protected or not, and that is a slightly... <coughs> in, in a way, it is a separate issue, because it has been protected, mm -hmm. you know, and therefore... Um, I, I think, as, as P Peter says, I mean, if, you, if you've gone to all the trouble of doing the public consultation, uh, everything that goes behind setting these things up, you should just follow through the, the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. alternatively, you know, delist de it. Yeah, but it doesn't, mm -hmm. the, the view, um, uh, that particular view doesn't say that no building should be visible beyond. It actually then becomes much more subjective and to do with the design quality. And I think this is an issue, again, which we obviously hadn't had time to discuss, that visibility of buildings in themselves do not cause harm. It comes down to then a whole series of factors which one has to understand. Yes, one should be clear that the mm. protection doesn't mean no under any circumstances. Yeah. It means what I think you referred to earlier as the sort of nature of the British planning system, which is um, uh, the occasion for a lot of conversations where a lot of strongly held views have to be reconciled. Yes. Now, at this point, I'd like to throw this open for questions uh, or comments on anything. It's Harry Handelsman. Good morning. Yes. Steve of Manhattan Love Corporation. Actually, I'd like to make two observations. The first thing is quite interesting. You, one is making reference to high, height and heritage. And one re, when one refers to heritage, one refers to buildings. Actually, to me, the greatest heritage of London is the Thames. And when you were showing the images, a lot of the images were the Thames. And it's quite curious when you, Paul, for example, showed an image what London looks like, you really showed quite attractive buildings. 
that were sitting in the city, etc. But however, if you do take a trip down the turns, Vauxhall, etc., I think there's a lot of issues in terms of what is happening. And those buildings are becoming incredibly visible because you've got a, 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 you've got a large piece of body of water that actually shows those buildings in a much larger, much bigger pers perspective. So they don't necessarily have to be 40, 50, even some of them are 60 story high. But uh, irrespective on, on the height, I think the issue about height and heritage and with respect to English heritage, I think it's, it, it, to me is one rather important issue. The other thing that I want to kind of make a comment on, and I find it a little bit bizarre because besides English heritage, you know, one has to go through a lot of planning issues. And I was involved with one of the grade one listed buildings uh, when, I, when I refurbished St. Pancras. And to be honest, the refurbishment of St. Pancras was English, on the English heritage guidance, where there were individual rooms that cost me millions in order to bring them to their previous kind of uh, 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 glamour. And I'm delighted with that investment because I think at the end we really created a fantastic building. What I find slightly amusing is across the street on the Houston Road, which isn't a very exciting road, is uh, Camden, who are moving now to King's Cross, are selling a building and uh, they are, you know, they're asking it. And it's quite interesting is the height of that particular building is really quite subjective and it appears that some, uh, some people within Camden actually feel, off, let us offer them more height <coughs> because if you have a taller building in that particular location is, uh, you know, you will get a potentially better value for the, for the value of, of, of your building. And I find that there's, there's a slight dichotomy. Across the street, you've got one of the greatest buildings in London, which I think St. Pancras is, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. Driving up the Grayson's Road, you know, towards St. Pancras, I think you, as soon as that sort of thing appears, I think it becomes quite, the building appears, I think it becomes incredibly beautiful. And yet, the local authorities are prepared for the personal gain to, uh, to sort of blight in that potential kind of uh, opportunity. Uh, and, and I think that's rather what is, uh, it's, it's quite sad. Now, I don't know what your comments are on that, but I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, let's take those each in turn. Um, firstly, the river, which of course puts everything in perspective. Um, Peter, I mean, the, the Thames can sort of take anything, can't it? Um, I don't think it can, actually. Uh, uh, and, but it takes tall buildings probably a lot better than it takes uh, lower buildings. I, mean, I, I think the redevelopment uh, along the river in the last 25 years has been one of the scandals of um, uh, recent development, really. I, I think there's a shocking series of buildings alongside where nobody has uh, thought enough about the relationship of uh, lower buildings, not taller, lower buildings, um, and uh, how they relate to the water in a way that have uh, been many successful examples from sheer warehouses through to Cheney Walk, uh, wonderful relationships of building river, and somehow we haven't replicated anything like that in uh, the developments along the Thames. I, I, f I find uh, I don't go on boat trips anymore because they're so depressing, really. <laughs> Robert? Um, the, yes, certainly the river is very important. Um, and uh, 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 very important to the image of London as well, because it is from there that you see uh, uh, the Westminster World Heritage Site, Tower of London World Heritage Site, and of course St Paul's, is with which we've been talking about. Um, the issue of height along it, though, is, is, a, is a difficult one, because actually it was very much a neglected part of London for a very long time. It was a working river, it had wharves along its frontage, um, and then some pretty... Uh, horrible office buildings were built uh, uh, along it um, before and after the Second World War. Um, now it's being reinvented as a residential destination and of course people will pay literally top dollar to have an apartment overlooking the river and so that puts the pressure on it. But at the moment um, there probably aren't sufficient um, controls in terms of how that should be managed. Um, I've been work working with Graham um, on, um, on a site um, in, in Albert Embankment, and there are other sites um, along there where um, it is appropriate to have height because it's sufficiently distant from the World Heritage Site, and in terms of the 
um, the, the venue, um, LVMF views, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no impact. And again, English Heritage, um, the GLA, Lambeth and other boroughs came together to agree what appropriate heights would be along there. And they agreed it should be tall um, or could be tall. So it comes down in the end, not so much to height along the river, but design quality, architectural quality. Now let's switch to this other question, Simon. St Pancras Chambers, <coughs> beautifully restored um, by Harry Handelsman. Um, a site opposite, tall building, you think out of the question or yes if it's good enough? Well, Harry has done an amazing job there and we all have to take our hats off to him for, for what he's done. And I can understand that he is anxious about the huge investment that he's made there with, with a, a big uncertainty um, um, immediately over the road. I, I mean, I, I can't comment any more than, than you can comment because um, we don't know what the proposals are going to be. But clearly, we all want a building of quality. We all want a building that um, uh, enhances that bit of actually quite difficult road um, and that works well with the, actually two very fine buildings because the British Library is a very fine building as well. Yeah. Uh, if I could add a comment myself, I would say that one would expect Camden <coughs> to have the same planning brief for that site as they would have been expecting if it was a privately owned site. In other words, they shouldn't be doing themselves special favours. It should be a planning brief based on quality of, of, of place and what might be desirable. Let's take another question or comment. I'm interested, Paul, about your question about whether the skyline is place and the rights that we have to apply and enforce visual uh, rules. It seems to me that a lot of the problems that we, we're involved in just now uh, come from when the public are regrettably persuaded by the idea and expectations of a listed view. It's very easy to understand the idea of a listed building, but the moment we shift to the idea of a listed view, we get into very difficult territory. Um, it seems okay uh, from all the studies that we've done, and we've worked on most of the tall building inquiries, as you know, to list the amenity value, so for instance from Primrose Hill looking back to the city, but the actual composition of the skyline is not the precise composition that is argued uh, by many. And we've done many studies, I think as you know, Paul, we've discussed this, where we've actually taken a skyline shifted it quite considerably and found that people either don't notice or don't mind. So we're applying energy in the wrong place. And I, I think the same approach also applies to Parliament Square. I agree completely that it, it was pretty misjudged that that was listed. You know, we're using this expression today, not the formal expression. But I find that most inappropriate. I think it's, there are much, much uh, better methodologies to use <coughs> to discover uh, where people enjoy viewing our cities from, and we're not employing them at all. Um, so I'm, let me ask a question of the panel. Um, I clearly have some uh, wishes and um, aspirations for the processes that we use. I'm involved in them, but I hope they'll continue to improve. How would the panel change, reject, or improve the current process, processes uh, uh, that, that we've got in place? St. Paul's Heights, LVMF other systems. What would you do to change? What's your aspirations? Now, I'll ask Bob to kick off on that one because, you know, you have to deal with this the whole time at, in your, in your uh, planning work and uh, inquiry. Yeah. Well, I think, in a way, we've sort of touched on that already to the extent that um, planning policy uh, it can be very useful and there's, there's very clearly um, a cascade from national through to regional um, to local and it allows each level to assert what's important for it in, in, in the broader or more focused sense. And so generally, um, both in terms of uh, my support for planning applications or when it, things go wrong and it goes to public inquiry, it's though, in the end, it's those policies which the barrister will always point out is what we're talking about, not the subjective issues. It's to what extent we are deviating or going against, deviating from or going against um, those, the, that, that, that cascade of policies. Um, so yes, of course they could be simplified. I think the, the new National Planning Policy Framework, the MPPF, has simplified um, that to an extent. But of course what happens is that old um, policy is still there in the background. Things like PPS5, which was to do with heritage, 
is still there in the background, as are you know, the various guidances in terms of how one interpreted that. So all those things keep on being dredged up. And so it's important to have clear policy. It's very valuable, I think, to the process of designing something to um, have clear guidance. But in a way, that it all needs to be rationalized and simplified um, so that uh, we can actually get through that process more clearly. And, and I think we do need to have more of an opportunity to debate the value of some policies. And I think, well, Peter Rees is here, the St. Paul's Heights is, is one of those because um, I think it's generally accepted that the, the level datum that it created from that sort of net effect of looking up from across the river to uh, a certain heights on, on St. Paul's um, has established something which is actually pretty boring in terms of a skyline um, where the, the St Paul's Heights has been enacted and of course the City of London has been very keen to preserve those. But, um, so I think I, I would argue for a, a streamlining of the process but to keep the process in place because I think it's very valuable for this whole um, debate about um, the most important impacts on our city. Simon, can I just take this a bit further because I think behind this question is the whole idea of, of a view, a view, a Canaletto view, it's painted, it's one, it's unchanging. <coughs> the listed view, if that's what it is, is essentially um, static, it's two-dimensional, and we still have to go through cross-examination at public inquiries. I mean, on the walkie-talkie, the EHQC tried to get me to say that a verified view as a postage stamp image on page 113 of the document was what the building would look like when built. Mm. And he didn't seem to get the point. It was the only really bad English Heritage QC I've ever come across. Mm. And I said, well, it won't be like that. And he said, but it's a verified view. And I said, but in real life, you could be walking past, not looking at it, looking the other way, looking at the sky, looking at your shoes. And isn't that the problem? That actually what we've set up is a completely non cinematic or scenographic method of analysis when in real life apart from people standing to take a photograph it's all about movement it's not about uh, it's not about stasis or it's not about you know the single fix no it's an incredibly blunt instrument and it's an instrument that's proved to be ineffective and and it doesn't um it doesn't address the key issue which is the one that robert raised which is just because a building is in the in a view doesn't mean that it's bad. It actually could mean that it enhances it. Yeah. And one of the one of the great great picturesque views, a word you used, um, of London is standing on the bridge in St James's Park, um, looking um, out towards the the, 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 the the Foreign Office and towards um, the Horse Guards, and the the interruption of the wheel in that view is a positive enhancement of that view, um, and. You know, there are, there are other examples I could give you of that. So I think I agree we do need to move away from a, a notion which says here is, here is a cone, a corridor, a view, a, a shaft, and it is protected. Yeah. We need to move to a much more sophisticated system. And actually, if you look at what um, we now do with, with buildings, with listed buildings, and all the, the, the emphasis on significance and asking the question, what is significant about this building? Um, we will protect what is significant. There are lots of things that are not significant. It allows a much more flexible use, a much more adaptable approach. The problem is that no one has yet invented um, a method, and we've tried, and no one yet has invented a method which allows you to <clears throat> have a system that uh, relies on significance rather than protecting something that is you know, drawn a, a line on a map. Thank you. Let's take another question or comment. This one right at the back. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, Robert Lau, associate editor with the council. I've heard a lot of discussions about public input and public discussions, but my question is, when does that end and how much public input should there be before someone, whoever that is, or whatever group that is that says, this is enough public input, this is enough discussion, and then at this point, wherever that is, we either move forward or don't move forward. Well, good question. I think that on a World Heritage site, I think Stanton Williams told me that the Enverons of the Tower of London, when they did their 
rather lovely upgrade that they had to consult 93 different organisations, which took them 18 months before they could actually formally make a planning application. Have things gone too far? Peter? Well, I think it's interesting when you talk to um, uh, people like uh, uh, Renzo Piano and, and Vignoli who talked about it earlier this morning, how much they enjoyed the debate. Um, uh, but they're only doing it, um, they only come in once and, 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 and do it. Um, I, I think when you have to uh, get involved in that debate on every project, it perhaps gets a bit uh, frustrating sometimes. But to a certain extent, uh, I do think that a lot of buildings um, uh, have, 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 have been hugely improved by the, the, the level of discussion and debate that goes into them. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think we've got it too wrong at the moment. And I think that people should be able to debate these things till the cows come home, actually. And, uh, and then you know, some, somebody, somebody makes a decision at, at whatever level it is, local authority or uh, at uh, um, ministerial level. But, uh, and, and, but uh, I think that uh, generally most of the buildings where there's been this ma uh, you know, major level of discussion, I think it's been to the benefit of the end product. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I had someone many years ago saying to me that they felt that the real problem was with the planning committee in, in the process, that, um, <laughs> that it wasn't really the people uh, themselves, it was their representatives who were the problem, because they gen generally tended not to be well informed about architectural matters. But I think uh, my response then, and I suppose what I've been trying to say today, is that it's not just about visual issues, it's about political and it's about economic, it's about a whole range of, of, of different concerns and actually you need people to represent those parochial views if you like um, as much as the, the big grand aesthetic um, issues which, uh, which uh, we confront as well. So I think the more the debate the better, I'm sorry if you know it takes 18 months because you've got 90 odd people to consult but ultimately if you're making a building to last for a long time which is what we should be doing then the more people you consult the better yeah well, i totally agree with that it's 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 about particularly buildings that have a as it were a public ownership a visual public ownership it's about legitimization and I, it's a point i made about the the shard i mean it is it was legitimized through the the debate it may have been expensive it might have taken a long time but it was legitimized i'll take another one if there is one yes please Hi, uh, I'm Anthony Wood. I'm the Executive Director of the Council. I want oh, to thank, hi. Sorry, didn't I want to thank you all for a fantastic <laughs> panel. It's been brilliant. It's been one of the best panel discussions. But one of the issues that came out of the plenary this morning and has kind of been mentioned at various times over the last day and a half, it's a pretty simple and a direct question that I'd like to ask. Is the 30 St. Mary Axe, Swiss Re, Gherkin Building, call it what you will, is it a vital part of our heritage in London already 10 years after it's built? Ah, yes. How soon is it going to be listed? So, no, actually, I'm, I'll rephrase that question because <laughs> you're a statutory body. Um, d good, already part of the heritage informally? Unequivocally, it is definitely part of the heritage. There's no, absolutely no doubt about it. I would be astonished um, if it didn't end up being a listed building, like the, in the nearby Lloyds building um, that's already been listed, uh, uh, unquestionably. Is there a problem about if clients think the building's so good that it's going to get listed that they might take a view about what its long-term value is. I mean, this is a serious point. Robert? Um, <laughs> have you come across clients who've, who've actually might have said, let's not go too far? No, no, I haven't. I mean, I've, I've, the, uh, the architect of uh, the Gherkin um, did say that someone from English Heritage said that, that they felt that, that the view as you're coming from the south of London towards it was so good that that view should be listed um, and that no other tall building should be built around it. But, um, but clearly what all that's saying is that people do recognise good quality architecture when it's built and uh, the, the, the difficulty in the process is that many people um, haven't got the imagination to conceive that um, a different looking building could be good when it's actually built and that's that's where the sort of problems lie but um, no I think uh, again this is why the process is so important it's important that the councils and the various authorities make uh, 
uh, a big issue of quality in architecture. And I, I think my big regret is that the design review panel since the demise of CAVE uh, and the rise of local design review panels is that the, the quality of discussion um, and the time given to debating uh, the quality of what, what we're proposing to build um, has gone down in recent time rather than up, and that's wrong. Peter, isn't it a bit surprising given that all the discussion has been all the great buildings that we see emerging at the moment? But actually, when you look at most tallish buildings in London, they're pretty mediocre, aren't they? Do you think, or not? Um, no, not most, actually. I mean, when I look at Central Air, I think that, that you know, yeah. we haven't got anything as bad as uh, we did in the 60s and 70s. So you've talked about uh, young people liking 60s and 70s architecture. It's fine. Uh, Erno Goldfinger, but if you think of horrible slabs where you dumped all over the place yeah. in the in 60s, uh, hideous and uh, you know, deserved to be blown up. Uh, but I think in Central Air, actually, uh, we've, we've got a pretty good... Uh, mix of, 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 of buildings and I think buildings in Canary Wharf have improved a lot actually from some of the stuff that they were building in their sort of intermediate phase sort of POMO era so I think that uh, it's not too bad. I think the interesting about the, the um, Gherkin is that uh, you know that's a problem you get when you hire Norman Foster is that of course Willis Faber Dumas had problems of what, what they would do with their swimming pool when they, that building got listed and um, clearly there are issues with the Gherkin at the moment you know the, it's never really worked very well at the ground floor you know what are they going to do to that do they get Norman Foster back to do it or um, how, do, how do they uh, bring that up to date and maintain the quality of the uh, original building. I'm going to draw things to a close with two observations. One, I think Peter quite right in saying that actually the quality of tall buildings, <coughs> certainly in central London in recent years, has shot up compared with the kind of average from 10 or 20 years um, earlier. And one can probably attribute that to <coughs> demand for quality from planning officers like Peter Rees, very obviously in the City of London, um, having quite a tough process, which means that the clients have got to be well financed and they've got to be serious in order to undertake it. And that's the most likely way that you're going to get uh, high quality people with some real commitment and the money um, to back it up. <clears throat> but the, the, the concluding thing is that I personally hope we don't end up with an inquiry over Elizabeth House because I think we will simply rerun all the, to me, slightly tired arguments that we had over Heron and the Shard and the walkie-talkie, and I don't think it'll do anybody any good. And I, I would come back to the point that, quite apart from a, from a pragmatic matter, if one finds that spot where you're going to be offended by Elizabeth House, for God's sake, plant a tree so you can't see it. <laughs> Problem solved. And secondly, which is the more serious point, you know, if you walk six feet, it'll vanish. And to me, the great irony about all this, at the Heron Tower inquiry, under cross-examination, I was able to point out, giving evidence for, for K, which is still reviewing, by the way, 150. <coughs> anyway, I was asked about this business about views and movement. And I pointed out that the best new view of St Paul's Dome in London at that time was from Tate Modern, which was newly done up. And that wonderful viewing uh, gallery, the, especially the external one, but inside as well, gave you fantastic new views of St Paul's, which very few people had seen unless you worked in the power station. Um, imagine the horror looking at the dome and just walking along a bit and suddenly one of the Barbican Towers appeared to be growing straight out of the back of it. Mm -hmm. Now, the Barbican Towers were being listed at the time. It didn't worry me in the least because if you moved back again, they vanished. If you moved a bit further, you got clear blue sky between them and I think, you know, it's a scenographic experience, a moving scenographic experience being in the city and I hope that's what informs, in the end, a decision about Elizabeth House, rather than what sounds to be rather disgraceful redactions. Uh, I've got presents for the uh, speakers and myself, I believe. <coughs> thank you uh, very much for your attention and your questions. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank the three panellists very much.